hi this is Kendra from Pencil and Pigment and today I'm going to be doing a intermediate watercolor tutorial video. I want to kind of put a disclaimer up on this video so please don't skip this part as it will eliminate a bunch of questions you might have as this video starts to progress. So in doing these longer format tutorial videos it becomes really easy to see why there are a bunch of beginner ones and not a lot of intermediate ones or advanced. And the reason for this, I think, is because it's so much easier to define and describe and explain an art medium in beginning terms, because essentially you just begin at the beginning. And I think in defining intermediate, it gets much more complicated as it means so many different things to so many different people. And it's hard enough trying to get artists to call themselves artists and a watercolorist could consider themselves intermediate after only using the medium for six months. I mean, this could depend on previous art and painting with other supplies skills or their subject matter that they're trying to create and the amount of time they have to devote to painting. Whereas another artist could still consider themselves a beginner after watercoloring for six years. So because of this, this intermediate video will be considered this way as it is compared to my beginning watercolor tutorial video, which has a longer, more complex tutorial. This one will have a longer, more complex tutorial at the end in comparison. So because I can't control who's going to see this video and in what order they're gonna see my videos and my channel, I'm going to link the playlist for my large, longer tutorial videos. And just to state a quick recap, as to what was included in that beginning watercolor video, thus sort of quelling the questions of why didn't you mention this product or this medium? Um, in that video, I covered tube and pan watercolors, synthetic and natural paint brushes, painting surfaces of paper, which is broken down further into weight, texture, size, and format, porcelain palettes, and water for mixing. So because those are sort of the industry stock standards. I wanted to, in this video, talk about the lesser known supplies, formats, and some fun DIYs where you can make your own, which will help for folks who are, you know, on a limited budget or doing a low or no buy art supply. Now I will include timestamps in this video. I think it's going to be a long one, so let's get started. The first watercolor supply I want to talk about is essentially the paint the watercolor itself. And these come in such a wide variety of different formats to look at. And I think that you might be aware of some of these or have used some of these. And some of these may be new to you. Some of these I do not own, so I will be throwing up a lot of pictures and examples and linking videos of other people trying the product because I only sort of buy now what I use. So the first one is watercolor pencils, and I have three formats here. I have two by Karen Dosh. This is the Super Color 2. This is the Cobalt Blue. This is um, the Museum Aquel. This is Ice Blue. And this is the Prismacolor Premier Watercolor in Peacock Blue. This third one belongs to our kids. And I'll be doing a demo of these later in the video to compare and show you what those look like. These pencils work great as being for watercolor because they're made with water-soluble pigments. And once you're done drawing, you could then go over and add the water and the pigment activates. So the pros of owning something like watercolor pencils would be these are great for doing fine detail work. You can control how much water you want to add. This is great for beginning and starting out or if you really want to get wild with it with more intermediate stuff. These are a great transition product for illustrators looking to try watercolor. Um, there is light fast info on the pencils and company web pages and the pigments are very rich and vibrant. So. There's little to no mess when traveling with these. And if you're into reducing plastic products or trash in general, this could be a great way to go about doing that. These blend really well with all other watercolor products. 
Um, there is light fast info on the Prismacolor. I will link what I have found. Keep in mind that the violets aren't very good in this series, so they may start to fade right away. Uh, the cons. The cons are that the artist grade quality pencils are really pricey. Um, the Museum Aquel, the one in the middle, retails for $3.36 US dollar a piece at Dick Blick. And those are the most expensive. Whereas the Prismacolor retail, when you purchase them in a set for about a dollar a piece, a little bit over that, it's US dollar. Um, I've never seen the Museum Aquel in stores, so that can be really hard to rely on online shipping, especially if you live in like a small city town, your store probably won't carry them. And keep in mind that your screen settings may not match the swatch settings when purchasing art supplies online. So be really careful with that. Um, and you kind of need a stronger knowledge of drawing and illustration, depending on what subject matter you're creating with these pencils. And if you do large art pieces, these won't be very cost effective. So that's what I wanted to say about those. The next product that I want to talk about are watercolor pens. Now these are the only ones that I own. I used to own, gosh, I don't know. I think it was a Winsor Newton a long time ago and I traded it. Um, if you are new to my channel, hi. I did a no buy note art supply all of 2022. And because of that, I don't really buy things I won't get enough use out of. So again, I'm gonna throw up more images of other ones that you can buy as I discuss these. So the pro to having watercolor pens are, these are really great for controlled artists and different styles. Um, you can get more efficiency with the water. You can dip them in water and paint from that well. If you're comfortable with markers and pens and ink drawings, this would make a great transition product. Um, Pigment-based pens are higher quality and offer light fast info. And these are really great for lettering and calligraphy if you want to do that with the watercolor style. These blend really well with other watercolor products. Now the cons would be dye-based pens don't offer the same amount of light fast info. Um, price, they can be really costly and they don't offer refills, so there's a lot of plastic waste. Like once you use it up, that's it. Um, some aren't sold as singles, so that can be really difficult. And many are hard to find in stores, so seeing the exact color depends on, again, your monitor, your cell phone color match, accuracy. So keep that all in mind. Um, again, these are the ones I own and I will demo those later. Another fun format of watercolor is liquid watercolor. Now I only have this one and it's very strategic for a reason. This is the Schmincke Aqua Drop. This one is in cyan blue. And the reason I have this one is because it most closely matches cyan when printing CMYK printers. So <laughs> that's why I own this, but it's really great. You already have this in a liquid format. You get to decide the strength and opacity of this product. Um, some are made from dyes and pigments, like a solution mixed together. Uh, some of them have gum arabic inside. Now, pros of this product are it's ready to use and it mix so well with other watercolor formats. There's light fast info on the artist grade products that different companies make. And these are easier to mix and match. And they last a really, really long time. These give a consistent color with every brush stroke. So if you're having trouble with consistency, this might be a really, really helpful product. Okay, I wanna talk cons of this product. These can be more difficult to control. So be real careful when using these. Check light fast info on some of the dye-based ones because they will fade in the sun. These can be harder to use after it has been put on a palette and it has dried and you go to wet and reactivate it. It can be much harder um, and can make blending more difficult. The cost, these can be really expensive depending on branding type. There was only one art supply store online that I could find that had this reasonably priced. So it is very, very limited. I have not ever seen these in stores. 
So keep that in mind. Again, this is the Schmincke one. There are some that are more affordable that you will find, like Dr. Martin and stuff. Uh, Windsor Newton has a drawing ink, but again, those aren't light fast. Okay. I want to talk about watercolor sticks. Now those are another fun format for the watercolor medium, and a lot of them are made from the same ingredients than the watercolor tubes. Um, these aren't those so much. This is considered, this is Pentel's version of a watercolor stick. It has no light fast info, the top one. This is more of a watercolor crayon. It has wax in it. I have a specific dedicated video to all the different ways you can use that. I will link it below, but I will also demo these just for fun because demos are awesome. So let's talk watercolor sticks, the pros. They hold a ton of pigment. Now, they allow for a ton of layering, which is like a thicker layer that's more um, tactile. They're portable. Um, there's some cases that I believe some of them sell. There's lots of flexibility as they are really versatile with other watercolor products. Uh, the Daniel Smith stick, which is, I believe, considered the artist grade version of it, is one stick is considered the equivalent of three watercolor pans, which is impressive and a great price. There are light fast options available with the artist grade quality ones. Um, cons for watercolor sticks. These may require, again, the case because they're soft and they can break. Uh, some can leave a residue while drawing, and they can leave drawing lines which are harder to blend out, especially with the lower quality. L not a lot of art stores carry these, so again, you are st like really dependent on looking at online swatches. Not all student grade, or especially are light fast if you draw. If you work small, a six size, you work in miniature, you like fine point detail, drawing with this sort of, mm, I would say lipstick size is just too big and becomes too difficult. But there are ways to use them. You can dip them in water and apply them to the page. You can wet a brush and put it to the stick and then use that brush on your page. You can rub the sticks in a puddle to create liquid watercolor or draw directly on the page if that is your preference if you're going larger. So with this, it's sort of what's best is what, what's preference. The last watercolor format I want to talk about and discuss is something I don't have at all. And I did a couple videos trying to make some and I failed. So for this, I want to talk about watercolor powder. And I will link some really great demo videos of artists using this product. Again, I don't own any. Um, I think if I bought one, I'd use it for the day and then set it aside. I just work too detailed for some of this stuff. And basically they're made of pigmented watercolor ink and sort of a dry crystalline powder. Pros. So why would you want watercolor powder? Um, there's tons of ways to use this product. You can mix it in water. You can sprinkle it on the page and sort of spritz water on top of it. There's a lot of versatility, which makes it um, very fun. It can be combined with a ton of other paint, other waters, gels, paste products, which if you are big into mixed media, this could be a great format for you. There's a lot of product per container with very vivid colors. Uh, some have mica and shimmers. Some are very affordable. Cons to watercolor powder that I have seen, um, a lot are sort of dye-based so have zero light fast and zero light fast info. They're not really considered a pure color. So many have other colors mixed with them, which could be a pro or con depending on what you're creating. If you just want one solid color to come out and it has other pigments that not, might not be the desired effect. So these are hard to find. Again, purchasing online, relying on those swatches. There's some limited color selections. Some are very expensive. Some have inconsistent granules that don't dissolve completely in water. So watch out, read all the reviews on these products. Um, I really like these specifically for bloom and abstract landscapes, but that's kind of just me personally. 
And with all this, with all these different formats of watercolor paint, what's best is what's preference to you, your style, the surface you're creating on, your interest, your budget, your level. It's just buy what you want and what you love and what you have fun using. Let's talk brushes. So fun brush ideas that you, you can use to really elevate your watercolor ability, style, are things like special effects brushes. You can buy some online or you can make your own by cutting, trimming, or edging some brushes you already own, which could be a great budget and time saver. You can make your own with found botanicals in your area and then tie them tightly with either like, I don't know, kite string, yarn, embroidery floss, dental floss if that's all you have, feathers, leaves, hair, dried grasses, um, bits of plastic tied to sticks could be used as well as any like old sponges, textured packaging, bubble wrap, cardboard. This is such a fun way to create textures and designs and shapes that are unique. Um, this can really help this sort of experimentation can really help break through artist block, trying something new and recycling things around you is beneficial and you can get the whole family involved. All ages can go on a walk and explore and make really, really cool brushes. Again, I'm throwing up images because I want you to see what other artists have created with what they have around them. And that can be such a fun seasonal project to do. Let's talk intermediate surfaces for watercolor. There are some add-on products available at art supply stores that can really open up your watercolor creating experience. Um, these aren't really products I own, again, but I will show you examples on the screen. The first one is called Sizing Liquid, and it is what it is. It is a liquid that is brushed on non-watercolor paper to help reduce absorbency of the watercolor. So this is most, you'll have to dilute this product with warm water and brush it on your page with a wider brush. And this can be great for adding watercolor elements to your art page that you're working on or even turn an entire regular sketchbook into one that allows watercolor. However, I would recommend when trying this that you make sure that the paper is on the thicker side so that it can handle the liquid without too much buckling and warping to the paper. <coughs> Excuse me. So make sure you're using stuff that's at least probably over 100 grams. GSM 140 plus would be even better just so it can handle the weight. The second product which can be added on top of this product for extra insurance is called watercolor ground. Now you would use this product like gesso and apply it straight from the container to the page. And the best thing about watercolor ground is you can apply it to a wide variety of surfaces and then you can watercolor over it. So if you've ever wanted to watercolor on wood, plaster, canvas, masonite, fabric, glass, plexiglass, metal, plastic, stone, or any form of masonry, Watercolor Ground is the product for you. It comes in some really fun colors like gold if you want to add a shimmer underneath what you're watercoloring. And my one tip for this is just make sure that you let it cure at least 24 hours before painting on top of it. So plan ahead when you go to use this product. There's even like a cold press ground if you want to add texture. And there's a light dimensional ground. Um, these are made by Core that can be applied if you want to add ridges and peaks, sort of a sponge-like texture to a piece of wood or your product, and then watercolor on top of that with that texture, which is absolutely a ton of fun. The next thing I want to talk about for watercolor mixing for trays or palettes and that's it it's palettes so basically your imagination is the limit when it comes to this yes porcelain is really nice um, you don't have to rush out and buy the latest greatest thing old dishes found at thrift stores the, my only thing with this is just make sure if you're putting dishes into your art supply rotation that they never end up back in your dishwasher in with your dishes in your cupboard you don't want to then eat off those dishes. Um, if you have pottery experience or access to a pottery studio, you could make watercolor palettes and mixing trays. I have seen artists use air drying clay 
Uh, Crayola makes a nice air drying one that's white and then you can seal it with a glaze that's water protecting and then you can make your own watercolor palette mixer tray. I will link a web page where an artist creates a beautiful one shaped like a leaf. I'll throw up a photo and that is a fun option. There's another product I want to talk to you about. It's by Rust-Oleum and it's called Painter's Touch Two Times Ultra Cover Flat Spray. And basically it's a paint and primer in one that adheres to plastics and metals. So if you want to turn your little Altoids or mint box into a palette and you're using the lid to mix, you would spray this on the lid and it would turn that into a great place for mixing that's white in color so you could see the colors easily. Um, pill boxes work as well. Again, it is your imagination that limits this, but this could be great for turning any surface for travel or creating things into palettes for mixing. So just DIY with some of these things and you can custom make your own product that fits your needs and wants and your skill level for what you're using. Okay, I wanted to do a little brief history of some of these watercolor supplies. However, it's really hard to find some dates on some of these newer things as it's kind of wishy-washy who created what first. But I find history fascinating. So for watercolor pencils, all the dates I found said 1940, though I read that the first watercolor pencil created by Karen Dosh was in 1931. And this watercolor pencil collection through the ages is from Tina K. Juno. I just really love this photograph here. Um, watercolor markers, liquid and powder seem relatively modern in their formats. And that's about all I have for history. I just wanted to throw up a little tiny section, say hi, and check out some cool people's stuff. Okay, for the first demo, I would like to do the watercolor pencils. Again, these are all in shades of blue. Our big doggo says hi. This is a Faber-Castell foldable portable water cup. It cleans really well with a magic eraser. I really enjoy it. Plus it has grooves for holding watercolors. Just telling you, you don't have to buy it. So let's get started with some of these. This is the super color. I'm gonna do little hearts. This is the Museum Aquel. You can see they're a little bit different hues. It was as close as I could get. This is the Prismacolor. This is the Peacock. They're pretty close in color. I mean, I did try. All right, let's just do a wet wash over these. So let's start with the Prismacolor. Again, these belong to my daughter. So there's two light brush strokes. This is the Museum Aquel. And this is the Super Color. So, payout. Um, again, I feel like with some of these products, you get what you pay for. So the higher the price, the better the product quality is. Uh, I could tell you with both of these, they're super, super soft. Again, I haven't, I don't have a lot of practice using the Prismacolor because these belong to my daughter. She got these for Christmas, so she's only had these eight months. Um, she has a 36 set. For just starting off, though, I mean, just for starting out, these could be a great watercolor pencil. Um, I wish these sold separately so you could sort of try before you buy and not, you know, and only spend a couple dollars, especially for my extreme budgeters. Like, I hear you, I see you, I know where you're at with your journey. But again, these are like in sets, 12, 24, 36. Let me get a round brush here. If you're looking to try and get rid of the entire line, I don't know if you can with this product. There is, this blue is very vibrant. I'm very impressed with the peacock blue. It's very beautiful. Let's try the Museum Aquel. Again, this is the ice blue, so it's a little bit different. I do not have 
a full set of the Museum Aquoil. I only have about four of them. They are pricey. Of the Super Color, I have like the 12 pack, the smallest. It was whatever was on sale. So I purchased those a while ago. So I've had them maybe since 2017, I think. And then I got the Museum Aquoil ones in 2018. So, <laughs> again, what's best is what's preference. Maybe you prefer something really, really pale. Uh, let's see how this re-wets and if we can pull color back down. There's a lot of scrubbing here. Hmm. I am using the Fabriano student grade watercolor paper and cold press. It's super budget, it's great for demos, it's great for kids, it's great for practicing. This one, let me find a drier portion. Oh yeah, this one just re-wets so much better. You could pull a lot of the color out. Just scrub these. I just want to show you like how rough you can be with these products. So they kind of speak for themselves. Let me show you something. So here's kind of a portrait I did with flower. I did a myth mythical beast sort of with matching botanical drawing challenge at some point. And this is a ghoul with horns and nightshade, the plant that's poisonous. But you can see how you can draw, you can keep portions from being wet. So you get the sketch effect, you can have the watercolor effect. These are all with the Museum Aquel, just because they're so vibrant. Again, if you like to illustrate, you like tiny things, like doing individual scales of a reptile can be really helpful and fun with watercolor pencils. So there's that. And with a lot of these products, um, these can be sharpened and the pencil top can be saved of the sharpenings and put into a watercolor pan. And then you could pull water from that. There's tons of different ways to use these. Dip them in water, draw with them that way. So they're a little bit more wet as you go. Your imagination is the limit. Let's move on to my watercolor pens for a demo. These are the Zig Clean Color Real Brush watercolor pens. And I have these in Persian green, which is a very nice sort of Prussian green. And then I have marine green. So let me show you these two. I've had these two a while as well. Oh boy, 2018, 2017. So this is the Persian green, and these are the marine green. Again, I believe the Windsor Newton are considered like the highest quality watercolor quality water watercolor pens out of all the pens. But I'm not a big like felt tip pen person, so let's add some, and you can see that really starts to activate and hydrate. And I can blend that out, and there are no harsh lines. Okay, let's do the next one. Just keep in mind when you go to use these that it really lightens up when you blend them out. The longer you let them sit, the harder it is to wash that hard line away. So keep that in mind as well. Some of these might be more staining. These are probably dye based. I don't know what the light fast info is on these. I would start with the Windsor Newton ones if you're an artist and you're at intermediate level and you want to sort of create some things. Let's see, I am going to, I had these for one very specific project. I finished that project. I have not used these since. I no longer live that sort of art lifestyle. So you can pull from the ink. I imagine you could sit this into a well of water and the ink will release and then you could have dyed water for water coloring directly from the well to the paper. Let's see if I can sort of get these two to blend together, be friends. I don't know. They look very similar when they're pulled out. So, also, if you are thinking about experimenting with watercolor pens but are on a budget or you don't really know if that's how you want to spend your money, 
yeah, that looks almost identical once it's blended out. Water soluble pens in general. So here is a Tombow. This is the black ooh, N15, I believe, something like that. Water soluble pens, you can practice them like watercolor pens. That is something to note. If you already own some Tombows and you kind of want to add some fun watercolor elements without purchasing stuff, these are fine. Add water right away and you won't see the harsh lines. So, food for thought when creating. The next product I want to demo is watercolor liquid. Now I am zoomed out so I can show you different ways to calculate this when making different values and strengths. Again, this is the Schmincke Aqua Drop in Cyan Blue. Uh, 480, I believe I got this at Cheap Joe's online. There's no store I've ever seen this for sale in. It has a flat tipped dauber. It's very flat tipped. Okay, so if I put drops in several of these, and let's make sure they're of similar size here. Okay, these are of similar size. First, I want to show you, <clears throat> and I'm going to have this all over me for the entire video. I apologize. Artists get messy and it gets distracting. I am always covered in something. So, that's why I have my smock <laughs> for every video. Okay. Really high payout. Again, this is full concentration of that dot. It's been sitting on the page a while. You can still see the original. Now for these, <clears throat> if you want some darker, obviously you would add less water. If you want some lighter, you would add more drops. But you can control the strength through how much water you add. Now I find with this product, I tend to waste more than I would like. And this is just my lack of experience with this product. That's 100% on me. But, so it's that shade, and this one has way more water, so it should be much paler, and it is. And that's how you would control this, what value you want. Do you want it dark, add less water. You want it pale, add more water. You could add white paint, depending on how you feel about white paint. That'll get it more cloudy, more muddy, depending on what effect you're going for. And then it mixes really nicely with other colors. So all these products mix, mix really nicely together. I can make a lovely, lovely periwinkle here. And that's tons of fun. So this is liquid watercolor. Sorry about that. I will link some videos where people are using liquid watercolors and creating bigger things than just little demos for you to look at in the description box below. The last watercolor product I have to demo are the Neo Color 2 by Karen Dosh and the Pentel Water Stick. These I ordered from Itzy. They come from Japan. I believe they're marketed towards them. This is part of the Antique series, but I have a whole video on these showing how I used them in the past. And this is about as big and chunky as I like to go. I have a lot of trouble using things that are sort of, oh, like the Faber Castell Gelatos. That sort of size is very lipstick shaped to me. And I like more detail in my art than that. These are a ton of fun. These blend really well with all watercolor stuff. And again, these can be sharpened and the shavings can be put into a watercolor pan. And that's how I was able to put my blue and green together, make a really nice teal, and they just sit in that pan and they can be reactivated and dried over and over and over again. So you could travel with them in a pan if you like. This one is a little bit harder to use. Again, it's not as rich pigment or quality. There's no light fast info. And I would do light fast tests on some of these products, but we don't get enough sun. So it becomes really difficult to sort of make that happen when the sun is just too inconsistent. 
I live in a forest, people. I do. I love the forest. That's where I live. But shade. Shade is the game. So with this one, you can see the original lines a little bit more. I would pull directly from here with the brush. Get the pigment out. That way I have no harsh lines and I can have the color. And these are just a ton of fun if you're interested in this format. And then you just sort of dry the tops of them and they travel well as long as, you know, your case is kind of protected. Um, these do break easily like crayons, so keep that in mind. Um, I don't own any watercolor powder. I cannot demo that for you. I can link my two failed videos where I try and make some. They're hilarious. I have a good laugh at myself. It's all enjoyable. Art is, art is amazing. Let's get to the next portion. Okay, next I want to talk about sort of the intermediate watercolor techniques. Now, again, it's all relative to my previous beginning watercolor tutorial video. These may not be considered intermediate techniques to you with what the style you're creating, with the products you've been using, with your life, but this is just what I have on hand to me compared to that other video. Now, I'm going to be using a Schmincke. This is the, ooh, I believe it's dark green cobalt. What is this? Cobalt Green Dark. I don't have them all memorized, but I'm going to be using this one. I'm gonna add a little bit of water to activate it here. And any of these techniques could be used for any of the products I've already mentioned, any watercolor products you already own. I just find sometimes with demos that little pans are really easy to move around and that's helpful to me, but I will try and incorporate some of these other products as well. So a really great intermediate technique and we're going to let this guy dry. Okay. So he's going to stay there. He's going to dry. We're going to come back to him, but a really great technique is understanding negative space. So a lot of times when artists create, they watercolor the item that they want to have. But with negative space, you're going to be watercoloring around that and understanding the space around it and leaving, let's add a little more water, and leaving that main space blank and understanding the negative space of that. Okay. Understanding negative space can be very, very helpful. Um, this sort of ties into traditional watercolor versus contemporary watercolor. Traditional watercolor, they let the white page be the white and use real thinner washes and layering where contemporary watercolor, you use white paint, it's more mixed media, you're allowed way more freedoms. Um, with technique and sort of materials. I don't, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> and I mean that in the sweetest sense of the word. I don't, however you do it that fits your budget, fits your time frame, fits your interest level is the perfect, most wonderful way. Art is for everyone. And I don't think any of this should be gatekeeped or looked down on or negotiated or discussed with, you know, derision. Like this is just, fun and amazing and relaxing and such a beautiful art form and medium that however you choose, if you want to add white, if you don't, if you want to throw in pencils on top or ink, that's wonderful. I love it. Tag me. I want to see it. I love all your art always. So understanding negative space and I have a little video on that, but it really helps if you take photography like on your phone and turn it black and white so you can see the huge value range of color within your photograph and begin to look at form and shape and leaving those shapes white. That is an intermediate watercolor technique, negative space. Another one, and I'm gonna need to get something for this portion. Let me make a stroke of pigment on the page and I'm gonna kind of thin it out so it dries a little bit quicker in real time. But another thing you can do as an option is you can lift portions of the color. And a great way to do that is to take a magic eraser, this one's mine, 
and dip it in a little tiny bit of water and you can sort of remove areas. You're going back in if you want to create sort of cloud effects, if you want to soften things, if it's just too deep in value, you can always lift a little bit of color and a magic eraser and experimenting with this with different colors and sort of getting different desired effects. We're gonna see, let's see here. Add a little bit of purple here. And I know purple green, it can muddy, but you can lift with this and practicing lifting for creating really like soft clouds in the sky is a lot of fun. It's a really great way to create texture and design and interest within your page and just really fun to experiment with. Um, these are sold by a wide variety of companies all over the internet. Our grocery store carries them. Okay, another great thing to practice, and I'm gonna zoom in for this one. So another really great technique is learning how to soften hard lines. Now I am just getting my brush as clean as possible. I have a little towel here. I don't want a whole ton of water, but if I want to try and soften some lines and go along the edges and learn how to smooth out and blend out hard lines, this is an intermediate technique. It makes things look softer. It's really great for blending things into one another. All right. And that's what this is for. See the really hard edges, taking a little bit of water and softening that up. Again, this is more of a granulating one within my set. I will do a specific dedicated video to granulating watercolor. But learning how to soften edges, boy, that wasn't even on camera, was it? So they're not quite so hard, is a great intermediate technique. And you can just keep cleaning your brush, getting the pigment out, keep softening the edge until it's all sort of softened all the way out learning how to get rid of some of those hard lines and smoothing it out. Again, this is really dry, so. And with things like this that you go to create little sample technique pages, uh, you could date them, you could make notes, write down what products you used, how well they worked, what you liked, what you didn't like, the techniques you use, um, any note to help you, you can keep these to track progress over long periods of time, or you can take things like this and you can cut them up, turn them into bookmarks or gift tags or thank you cards, postcards, things like that. So that's not really a waste. You're still creating product and something fun that you can use and gift to somebody for something. Again, Christmas is coming. I know it's a ways out, but this is green. This would be a fun little gift tag. And these are the techniques that are really, really helpful for intermediate. And then understanding value as you practice and understanding the full range of color that one color can have and make. And being able to control that value within a palette, within how you lay that down. Like if you want a mid-range, if you want really dark, and if you want something lighter. Again, this is just by controlling water. Well, that's off the page as well, I apologize. Let me do that again. So we have dark. I'm sort of a mid-range, and I'm gonna lift this so it's a little bit lighter. Understanding the value range within the colors you have, and then light. That needs just a scotch of color. There we go. Of one color. The opacity, how transparent and translucent you can get it. Understanding value range within one color of watercolor for all your products, whether it be pencil or pen or... Let's do a pencil real quick. She's going right off the page. 
So this is how I would demonstrate value with colored pencil. And you can see how little I've touched the page here. So that would be dark. And again, I'm cleaning my brush between all these so there isn't any like cross contamination and this would be light. Understand value. That is an intermediate watercolor technique and understanding your products and the range of color you can get from them. And then practice blending them out, getting soft lines, layering, negative space, and lifting. I hope this helps. Let's get on with the next section. All right, now we are on to the last portion of the video, and this is the tutorial. Now this is intermediate watercolor, so I am going to make some assumptions. I am going to assume you own watercolors. I'm going to assume you have a larger set. Basically, the colors we're going to need for this is a warm yellow, warm orange, warm brown, and a black and we are going to mix those together and a little bit of red. And that could be a cool red. Alizarin Crimson would work. Cadmium Yellow would be fine. And we are going to watercolor a giraffe today. I'm gonna to throw the picture up. I'm gonna trim it so we <laughs> don't have so much distraction from the dappled sunlight leaf background. I apologize, it's a beautiful day and folks are out and about. So I am going to use some of the colors I already have. I have a 36 set. I'm going to be using those colors. Uh, I can do a color mixing video for watercolor if you are interested. Different ways to make skin tones, different ways to create colors. But for this one, it's going to be some convenience colors. I am going to be using probably ivory black, burnt umber, Venetian red. Hmm, I like Venetian red a lot. And maybe a little bit of yellow ochre. So let me add some water to my pans to make that a reality. And then I have a little tiny palette here where I'm going to mix and dilute colors to get the exact colors that I want to achieve here. I do like the Venetian red. Burnt Sienna would work as well. Um, a lot of these are colors that folks tend to have on hand. So let's get started. And we're going to do a different, a couple different techniques within this tutorial. Wet brush, dry brush, understanding layering, understanding how much water to put on a brush, understanding how much something needs to dry before you can go back over it with another layer. These are intermediate watercolor techniques. Again, if you're seeing this out of sequence, I have a beginning watercolor tutorial that might be a better fit to watch first and understand with beginning level techniques to practice to get to this level, but we're gonna get started. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. I'm gonna start at the top and go down. That way I don't rub my hand through the watercolor, if that makes sense. And I am going to start off with a little bit of the burnt umber for the tips of the peaks. Now understand how much water you have added to the page. I am creating little tiny mm, semicircles here. And this watercolor tutorial could be an hour long, three hours long. I could do it in real time. There's so many different ways to do this, but I can't put all the things in one video as this video would be a year long. <laughs> I would never be able to upload it. So I have to have some cutoff somewhere. I'm gonna add just a little tiny bit of lamp black. I want to shade kind of as I go. And because this is wet, it is going to bloom in and I can tap it and kind of bloom it out. I want shade, I want highlight, I want color. We are gonna go down in, now I want a really dry brush. I am going to take probably my Venetian red and just tap it in there lightly. 
and you can have a separate page off to the side where you practice some of these strokes so you get comfortable understanding what that looks like before you apply it directly to your illustration. I want drier strokes than this, but we are gonna start with this layer first for the color. And again, knowing how much water you have used so they don't bleed too much into each other, these two colors are going to abut each other and sort of lightly blend. I want to go in with a little bit darker. I'm gonna go back in with the umber, just a little bit. I want a little bit, it's a little red. I'm gonna create some little strokes here. Again, this is still a damp page, so it blooms out and blends nicely. Now, I can soften the edges up by pulling out and you get the effect of fur while blending. Giraffes are fuzzy. They just are. I hope this is zoomed in enough. I want to get the entire giraffe on the page, so it's kind of a strange, strange happy medium here. Now, we're gonna go down and we need to add a little bit of water to our brush for this shape. We need to thin it out so it becomes lighter in color and lighter in color is more water. It is not adding white. Adding white tends to muddy and cloud your color. Now we have another little hump that comes up here and understanding that hump, I have traced it out so you can see it. You can do that as well. I'm gonna go in, back in with the burnt umber and I want it a little dark. And again, it's wet, so it's gonna bloom out and that's okay. Fur is soft, it's fuzzy. There is no wrong here. When it comes to watercoloring animals, because you want a little fuzziness, you want to denote that. Now there seems to be a darker ridge within that ridge. Can you see it? Okay, I'm just making sure we can all see what I'm doing here. And kind of another little triangle shape. So, this is part of the hump. I want a little tiny bit of black. I want, and you can use any black you want. I have ivory black within this set, but if you're doing vegan vegetarian stuff, you may want a different black. And this is getting it much darker and I'm here for it. So we need to move on to a lighter color. We need to move on and I will do the yellow ochre. Now I'm gonna take that and probably thin that out because it's super yellow. And the draft just isn't this yellow. So I'm gonna add a bunch of water to this color. And I want to mix it with just a little tiny bit of the burnt umber here, just to make it a little bit browner. And a little bit more water. And just try and get a really neutral, sort of beige ivory color going on that you are fond of that'll show up. Now mine might be a little darker than yours. I want you to be able to see what it is we're doing here. We are going in and we have to soften this line. This line has dried, but we need a really soft color here for the body of the giraffe. And this arches up. These arch up, we're gonna have ears here, okay? If you don't like hard lines within your watercolor, you can go back in with a lightly damp brush and soften lines. Okay, you don't wanna go in with a sopping wet brush or a dripping brush. It has to be just lightly damp. And you can kind of pull down, you can pull across, you can pull up and blend some of those lines. If you think those lines look too harsh, too unnatural, too unrealistic, and we can then, once this dries, go back in with another layer. So let's move on to ears. And I kind of want to add just a little tiny bit of black. I almost want this a little dirty. That sound weird? Okay, let's do some ears. The ear shape, it comes up. I am splashing, aren't I? With enthusiasm. It comes up and goes over. It flattens out, turns the corner, comes back down. If these were leaves, they'd be beautiful. They're giraffe ears, so they're even more lovely. Goes up, 
flattens out, curves, comes back down. Now, I'm going to do the lighter color first and allow this to dry before we go back in with black and add the shading of the ear. I want this to dry. So, all right, so those are the ears and that is a fun little light ivory color and we can make sure that <clears throat> we add speckles and things once we're done and there's different ways to speckle and splash if you are interested. Now we need to sort of bring down some of that red. I'm going back in with my Venetian. It may need a little bit more water to sort of pull that down and then into Giraffes have dots. They have dots, they have little lines, they have little speckles. Giraffes are made of lovely. This is my husband's favorite animal. This is the burnt umber. This is one of his favorites, so I chose to do this one today. Now, there's just some little lines. This is creative licensing. Do you want <clears throat> the little dots? Do you want little marks? You can make it as close to identical as possible as the other one. You can go back in and add with a finer tip brush than the one I'm using, hairs. Hairs for texture. And you can soften that out. This is this is up to you how hard you want your lines. I'm gonna do this all probably in one brush, but having multiple brushes um, in the round, a fine tip, a four, and then maybe like, I don't know, a zero or double zero for some of the fur would look even better than mine. We are going to do eyes, okay? Eyes are gonna be dark, they're gonna be black. Now, there's a multitude of ways you can do this. You can just do the black eye and then go back over it later with either like a white Posca pen, those are a paint marker. You could do a white gouache or acrylic for highlight, or you can try and do it <laughs> all in one go and then make sure you add the white highlight. And that's what we're going for. So we're going for like a little lid and it comes up to an arch and he comes back down. And here is the eyeball, it is circular. And then there is a little bit of white space here. And this is the eyelashes. Giraffes give great eyelash, they just do. And this whole thing is solid black for me. There's one eye. Again, I'm using ivory black. A lot, of, um, a lot of people don't care for this one. This is just what came in my set. There is bone, animal bone in it. It is not vegan or vegetarian. So this one I'm going to arch over. Again, it's gonna flare out. If you have a tinier brush, that make the flare out even more fun. And we're going to arch down on this one a little smaller. And we're going to arch again and keep a little tiny bit of white Keep that white, okay? That's your highlight for the eyeball. You want this nice and dark. And then from here is the eyelash, okay? These are your giraffe eyes. Are mine equal distant? They are okay. Um, you can use a ruler, you can trace it out with a pencil to make sure that yours uh, line up accurately. It's however you feel comfortable in doing this tutorial. If you want to pre-sketch shapes, that is definitely a way to go. Keep in mind, again, if you're like, why is this so hard? This is intermediate. Uh, I don't know what advanced looks like. I'm not a strict watercolorist. I am an artist. I am an illustrator. I do a little bit of everything. So we're going to go back over the nose because if we tend to do the color around this, it's all going to bleed and we're going to lose this really dark opacity of these eyes and we want to keep that intensity. So let's get some of the Venetian red. Again, you can mix a red and a brown together and get a really nice Venetian red. Put in a little splash of orange. 
we're kind of going to dot in, I wanna dot in some texture here for the face. And I am just doing a little tiny sort of push up motion splotches. We're gonna to get to the nose here. You ready? The nose has a little bit more orange. Oh, I'm just gonna put in yellow ochre in my Venetian red to make that a little bit more orange. And I think I used just a little bit too much ochre. All right, there you go. Color match till you get the color you want. So for the nose, we have to make sure that we get the nostril around and then inside the nose is going to be the, the jet black, okay? So, and we want to line this up, make sure it's sort of towards the edge of the eye. This is how you do animal accuracy. I just make sure things sort of line up when I'm looking at reference photos. I just did an arch up and I'm kind of going down and I'm curving around. This could be a loose leaf shape. This could be kind of a diamond shape. I'm going to do it on both sides here. This one doesn't really line up with the eye. The giraffe is sort of tilted to the side. So, okay. And I really like this color. I'm gonna add a little bit more Venetian red to it. They get darker when I go in for the mouth portion. And the mouth portion comes off and it really comes to like an arching point here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add some water and thin this out on the page. I want it to be lighter in color on the sides and soften it up. And I want the darker in the middle. Again, you don't have to use the exact colors of the giraffe. For this tutorial, if you want your giraffe to be blues and greens, then make a blue and green giraffe. Oh my God, I wanna see it, please tag me. Um, <laughs> Any colors you have are the perfect colors for your giraffe. If you cannot make these exact colors, do not get discouraged. Do not get mad. Try and mix and match as best as possible. Get as close as you can if you are interested in that. If you don't care that it doesn't match, awesome, here for it. It is art. There is no right or wrong way on this channel to do art. If you are enjoying it, you are doing it correctly. I'm gonna go back in. I wanna add a little tiny bit of brown. I'm gonna smooth this out. It's just a lot of figuring how much water you have on your brush, how to smooth out the different colors and get the value ranges you want within the illustration. Now, there is a lighter mouth tip here and I'm just gonna pull color from the tip before I go to create the bottom portion. And the bottom portion looks like the bottom lip here. That's just a little connecting sort of swoop, okay? Giraffe mouth, yeah? And if you have colors bleeding, you can dry your brush, take the dried brush to that portion and lift with your brush and blend it all out. So you can pull color up with your brush, okay? Now I'm looking at my eyes. My eyes are starting to look pretty dry. So I wanna come in this really pale color and sort of fill in some of these gaps before we start layering. All right. I've never overheated my camera before. Um, <laughs> this is a new experience for me. All right, so we are making sure that the body of the face comes directly from this portion of the eye all the way down and it meets in the mouth and there is a strong jaw. This giraffe has a very strong jaw. And this side is not, you see that? I'll add more pigment so you can kind of see it. The side is not so prominent because the head is slightly twisted. So the head comes from the middle of the range of the mouth. It arches out and meets under the eyelash. I'm not touching the eyelash, not yet. I have a lot of water on my brush and I don't want things to bleed. So I'm gonna kind of come in between colors a little bit, soften lines here see if I can abut some of the black without it blending and soften some of these colors together. 
and we're starting to get a giraffe shape. If yours does not look like a giraffe, oh my gosh, you've invented a new animal and I am here for it as well. So let's go back in. My black is drying up over here. Get some black. We're gonna fill in the nose nostril. It is very, very tiny. I am doing one side. Again, I'm having a little bit of bleeding just because it is so wet. Go back in with a dry brush and I can keep lifting till I get the look I desire. And that's just a little bit too wet. So I'm gonna dry brush more black on and leave a little tiny bit of white. I want a little seam of white. So that is the highlight from the page. And again, we can soften this stuff out. With the brush. Okay, now we need to add some more color, some more stripe. And again, I am going in and I am smoothing some of these lines. I don't want quite the harsh line. Are you ready to do the inside of the ear? I'm ready. I'm ready. You can either do straight black or mix a dark brown and black. Sepia would work if you mixed an umber with a black. Might look a little bit more natural. I'm going to do a little Venetian red, I think, with my black. Just to add a little pop of color so it's not completely all dark. And I am going to do a triangle shape. Yes, add a little bit more color and a smaller triangle underneath it that kind of connects and another smaller little shape. Okay, and I'm making sure that these arch around and if you want to denote that there's hair there, you can pull these out. You can take all the pigment off your brush, dry it, and you can kind of pull the edges out and soften it a little bit if you want a little bit more gray value. If you think the black is just a little too harsh. And that can be pulled out into a shadow of the ear. And there's hair here. And understanding that there's like a little, there's a little line here in the ear. And I need even less pigment on my brush, so I'm cleaning my brush. I'm gonna soften this out a little bit. And just soften this whole thing out here. There. And this comes down. There's an ear. So. Little fun, little wild. Let's grab some more of that dark color. Let's do the other ear. The other ear has like a triangle that kind of goes more like this. An upside down triangle that meets and sort of turns into another swooping shape and another sort of, like you want to do a circle, but you can't commit. There's gonna be hair and fuzz and all kinds of stuff. This is an animal. We are here for it. Here, let me pull some of that out. And we want to have some of the shadow for the underside of the ear. And that can be kind of pulled down, pulled out. Again, clean your brush. You just kind of want water on your brush for smoothing this out and trying to blend this out and make it look more realistic. Again, there's kind of a harsher ear defining line at the bottom that kind of goes around. And that can be as dark or as light as you want that. If you don't like it, put a little water on your brush, squeegee that out, make sure your brush is just slightly damp, not wet or dripping and you can smooth this stuff. You can manipulate it to blend, okay? And these are some very fun ears. 
now. Our face should be drying, depending on how large you're creating. The larger you create, the more drying time you have when you move to different areas and move around. If you're working really small, you may need a hair dryer, some sunshine, take a break. We are gonna go back in and we are going to add the dots. Now, I like the burnt umber, but I want a little red in it. Let's add some reticulated dots here. Some of them are a little bit more redder than others. I'm gonna pull one from the nose area and it's just gonna kinda of come down. It doesn't have to be symmetrical. It doesn't have to be a perfect defined shape. You can pull little lines out because fur and animals are not symmetrical. This is the beauty of animals. Each sort of dot you go to create can be a little darker with a little bit more brown you can decide that you don't like how high one of those goes and you can make it go a little higher. It can start thinner and redder and then you add brown as you go and put more brown into it for the dot, for sort of the reticulation. Again, you can lighten these up. You can pull it out with a damp brush. You do not want your brush soaking wet, okay? That's where you run into lots of bleeding problems. And then something off to the side here and a little dot. Let's do another darker one on the bottom here. With these sort of shapes that you were given. And you want different value ranges. You want some redder, you want some browner. It makes it look more natural, more realistic, more closer to an actual animal if things do not blend specifically, okay? So these are sort of the dots we have. Now I am going to take a very dry brush that is loaded with pigment and I am gonna kind of poke a dot here for some texture and I want it a little bit redder and I am gonna come in and I might soften this with a damp brush at some point, but I want some texture for this giraffe. I want him looking really good, really slick here. I'm adding designs and little polka dots. And I can add some under the lashes. Now I'm gonna take my brush, clean it off, dry it, just squeegee all the water out of it, and then I'm gonna kind of soften these a little bit so they're not quite as harsh. So they look a little bit more natural, a little bit more blended out, a little bit more like they belong. Now don't forget that the giraffe has a ton of brown over its eye. So I'm gonna take some ochre here, make it really dark. Again, this is a pretty dry brush. And I'm gonna pull some lines out here. It's kind of like an upper eyelid, if you will. There is some brown. Hmm. It's a brownish black underneath the ear next to the eye that you can mix with your ear color. For this one on this side, there is brown. These are very brownish dots. I'm not seeing a lot of red in these ones. And then there's, I want just a little tiny bit on a damp brush of the pigment and I'm just gonna kind of brush some color up for texture. I want more going on on this face. I want some shadow here. I want it telling a story. This giraffe has seen things. It has eaten some leaves. Maybe a lion was nearby. Like there's a whole story going on here. So let's add the brown, the umber that has a little tiny bit of red around these eyes so this one gets the eyelid treatment as well. Like we want, we want it to know. We see you, we hear you. And then a dry brush that's very damp with just a little bit of pigment. So you can add just a little bit of blending this out Again, check the amount of water on your brush. If you need to squeegee some out onto a washcloth, however you prefer to do it, 
go for it. You want to add little tiny fur textures. So you want a really dry brush, okay? You start adding some more fur. This is the burnt umber. I'm going in. I want the fur. I want the stripes. I want the dots. You could do a separate layer of one that's more red, or you can mix the colors together, save yourself some time. You want little tiny strokes. This is part of the fur for the giraffe. It is a lot of texture. There's a lot going on. Again, this isn't beginning watercolor. This is understanding shape, understanding how to pull color out. If you have trouble identifying color, identifying different values, cut yourself a little viewfinder, take a piece of paper, cardboard, whatever, cut a little square out and start holding that up to bits of things and pull individual colors out. I want to add just a little bit of texture on the nose. For fun, I'm adding a little bit of brown. I want fur, I just want fur everywhere. Now there's a little bit more darkness um, around the nostril that can be sort of denoted. And again, I'm this is a very dry brush. And if I add too much, I can wet my brush and kind of pull I can pull a little bit off, I can smooth a little bit out. You have control over your brush. Don't think because it's watercolor, the water's in control. You are still in control. We want shadow underneath these nostrils. Grab some of that burnt umber, add a little bit, blend it out, smooth it out. You control what this looks like. You can keep lifting and adding. That is the beauty of watercolor. You control how much is on your brush, you control how much you add. Now I want more shadow here to pull up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of this color here that we have made, and I'm going to kind of dabble it in and rehydrate some of these spots. So the fur is a little bit darker, so it looks like there is more shadow. It is going up, okay? Let's see, I can add a little bit more burnt umber stripes here. Again, I am just using one brush, but if you have a really tiny brush, you can make this look really realistic. You can go in different angles. Fur doesn't all go in the same angle. It goes in lots of different directions. That is one of the fun things about fur. So you can really like have some fun with it and make sure that some are really dark some are really washed out, so it looks like, it looks more realistic. Now, we're gonna add a little neck here, should you be so inclined. Um, we're going to pull out from the edge of the mouth here, and I'm just gonna kinda do the spots around the spots. Negative space, people, negative space. Here, I want to come down. We can really see the angle of this guy. I hope you can see this on camera. Oops. Let's grab our magic eraser here and lift that off. Okay. Sometimes I splash. I get so enthusiastic. How is your giraffe coming along? Don't you love giraffes? They're amazing. They're amazing. My husband was correct, they're the best. All right, let's get some more red, Venetian red, and let's do, we wanna shape right here. This is too dry a brush. I'm seeing too much white when I am making the stroke. There is just not enough water. And we are gonna kinda go in, and it's a little wet, so it's gonna bloom out, it's gonna soften. It's gonna look really nice. And then underneath here, depending on how hard a line you want, how dry it is, okay? There's gonna be shapes in here. And then there's one under here. So this is not quite dry enough for hard lines, but we are getting the shape we want. Now I wanna add some more dark. You have to add darker colors with your mid-range. You want to denote shadow, okay? 
And then here is the fir. So let's do the burnt ochre. I'm sorry, burnt umber. And this will be the fir. Okay. And again, this is really wet, so it's blooming out. And then the shape here kind of goes up the neck. And then there's a really pale one below. So I have, know how much pigment and payoff you have on your brush to how much you can add. You can always add a little more. Taking away takes more work. And if you want the whole thing to be sort of bloomy and dreamy, you can do that technique. It's just way more water. If you want it to be, see individual fur strokes, brush strokes, you're gonna want your brush more dry. You're gonna want each layer more dry before you go back in to get those hard, clean lines. This is water control. This is understanding that when you're creating. See, that's too dark. I can go back in with a damp brush that's clean and I can continue to lift to get the color I want exactly. So, now we want to add a little bit of shadow. There's a little bit of like a face in here. I want just like a little bit of a drop shadow, I think. And this is going to be dark in here because this is where the mouth is hanging over. Just making sure. So I want this a little bit darker under the neck. Again, I can lift if it's too dark. It's just removing water and pigment from my brush and then applying the brush back to the page. Okay. If you want to reshape a chin, reshape an area, you can go back in, soften the lines, add more lines, add more color, add more dots, add more polka dots, add more stripes, just add more. So if I go with a very dry brush, I can go in and create more. Let's see, it's too dry. Let's see. Hmm. I need a little bit more water here. Get the opacity up. You really have to wet these. Make sure you have the opacity where you want it. And then go back in with little dots, little stripes, little textures. You could even flick pigment on here if you want to. Sometimes little dots create the added fur texture that you're looking for. back on that hard line. I like him. I like him and I like him fuzzed out. Okay. Here is a giraffe. Now on you could have a complete side page where you practice these wet strokes, damp strokes, dry strokes. Um, going back in, softening things up, understanding the difference between the two lifting, smoothing out, creating texture. Drafts are a lot of fun. If you want more defined edges, you can add a little bit more ochre, a little bit more brown. It's up to you. Again, this is your giraffe, how you want it to look. This is how I've created mine with the colors I have. Again, I used ivory black, burnt umber, Venetian red, little burnt sienna and yellow ochre. So very earthy, earthy tones. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope this helped. This was an absolute lot. <laughs> this was a lot. So I just want you to know I'm proud of you. You've come this far. It looks great. Keep touching up, keep color matching to, you know, the reference photo. Keep fiddling with it. Maybe take a step back. 
One technique I love is just to prop this up vertically in a room and then when I walk in the room I can look at it and see what I kind of want to tweak, what I don't want to, if I want to add a little bit more color, if I want to add a little bit more value within the ears, within an area, and really just kind of mess around with it and soften some things, harden some other things, maybe go back and figure out a better solution for ear hair and negative space. Maybe go back in with some lighter colors to add a lighter value within the little stumps on top. There are tons of different things that can be done. Let's see if we can do that. With the color we're working with here. It's pretty opaque. I mean, the yellow ochre I have is, it's pretty strong here. So if I want to add some lighter values in here, I can. Just keep mixing, keep exploring, keep working around with it. Keep figuring out shapes, value, what you enjoy, what you don't. I hope you like this tutorial. I can do more just plain watercolor tutorial videos without techniques and the history and all the things if you are interested. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful afternoon and I will talk to you later. Bye.